Um, so my name is Michael, Michael Olbrich, or Michael Olbrich if you want to just do it in German, but Michael is okay too. So I'll be talking a bit about um, updating embedded systems. Um, let's talk, start about me. Um, I've been working on embedded Linux for quite some time, working for Pangotronics the whole time, and this is mostly support kind of tasks, start getting boards, hardware to start running Linux, helping with things when there are bugs, basically to allow our customers to do their own applications, right? So we do the base Linux operating system, and they uh, kind of focus on their own applications, the actual stuff that they want to do with their hardware. So, and I mean, updating is not something that you want to care about, this is something that's supposed to work. So I've seen that for uh, quite a few projects in, uh, over the last few years. It's getting more. In the beginning, it was more like updating. Do we have to do that? Maybe we don't need to update. Our software is OK. And nowadays, updating becomes more and more important. And as I've said, I've worked with a lot of different projects. So my focus is less on uh, how the individual, the, the updating process itself works. But I want to focus here today on more. What do you have to do to integrate an updating tool, an updating software, product, whatever, um, with your own application, your own product? Because, I mean, we've had a talk yesterday about updating. And if you look at other conferences and look at the talks there, the videos, you'll find several talks uh, about updating software that describes the software itself, and that's important. And it's not easy to get right, and, but we're getting there. And that's the stuff that can be shared. But there are a lot of parts of the updating process itself on a, a, a particular device that is device-specific or um, in a ways uh, where you have to do, add your own features, your own stuff to make it really work. And that's the parts where I want to focus on. Um, so a bit about updating first. I'd like mostly to focus on the standard simple A-B setup kind of um, updates where you have one running system and then you have a separate partition where you can write the new version of your operating system into it while your um, system is still running. And then when all that process is done, then you say, OK, now I'm finished and I can start the other operating system, the new version of my operating system. Um, and if that fails, that's an important part. Maybe there is some bug in there. Maybe the um, rating the, the operating system failed in some way and didn't detect while it was flashed. Or maybe in this special use case, there are some outside circumstances um, that um, make the startup or whatever fail. So in that case, we want to go back to the original version, to the previous version that worked, right? And if you look at that, writing the update itself, that's mostly generic, right? I mean, there are a few ways to say I write a file system image to the disk, or I format a new file system and extract a tuple into that, or these kind of things. But this is not really project specific. That's something you can implement once it can be tested really well. But when it comes to checking, OK, so my system is not starting. What does that mean, my new system is not starting? There are a lot of ways that it, that can fail, and many of those are project specific. So um, that's part of where, where I want to go, right? We need to detect those failures, and then we need to say, okay, something happened here, and I want to go back to the old version. And then maybe there's some user interaction there. Um, do I say explicitly? Okay, something's wrong. Can we go back? Depends. Really, it's really on the on, on the on the devices. Sometimes it's some um, 
embedded um, IoT device, then this has no user interaction, and it has to be automatic. But often there are devices and, uh, and then operators in front of it and say, this is not working. I've just applied an update, and now it's not working anymore. Can we go back to the last one? These kind of things. And that's um, when you need to integrate the update mechanism with um, your own system. So let's start with the failures. I'd like to classify at first what kind of different categories there are. So, um, and depending on those, how we can react and how difficult they are to, to work with that. Let's say startup failure, that's the pre this is simple ones. And that's typically what you see when your slides, I remember from yesterday, there was this, okay, we have installed a new, then there was three lines of, on one slide were said, okay, we start the new image, and then there is our own, we talk to our update server again, and then you can hook in something else to check if, it's, if the new system is okay. That's the startup. You, you can, a lot of stuff can be detected on the first startup if it comes up and it works. And, but some errors come later, either because some user interaction comes afterwards, and only with that user interaction things, things start to fail. Or there is memory corruption or there are memory leaks that take some time to um, occur. So maybe um, you, the system starts, but it starts to break down afterwards. And then there is a, I call this update preparation errors. Um, it means you want to um, install a new update, and that's not what, and you, you don't get to the point when you actually write something, right? You can try that again, or, and it still doesn't work, and maybe you can go to the old system, and then there's this, I call it update errors, um, and if they are permanent, um, that's a problem, because if you say, okay, I have a system that is running, I try to write an update and it fails because the update process is broken and I ca don't can, cannot go back anymore to the previous one. So we have to be really careful there um, to make sure that that doesn't happen or there's even more fallback. But at the end of the day, some, at some point, uh, the effort to work around or to... to handle those issues gets pretty high and the probability that they occur pretty low. So there's some, at some point you need to stop and say, okay, this is enough. These are the things I check for and for everything else. Okay, the device is bricked and we have 0.001% um, boards that fail and then we can replace those and that's okay. Um, so failure detection on startup. Um, the most important thing there is first the hardware watchdog. If you're doing these kind of things, it's pretty mandatory that you have a hardware watchdog that can detect problems when booting because um, at some point it might be the Linux kernel that's basically just not starting or gets stuck somewhere in, in hardware initialization and you, you only can, the only way to recover from that is when a hardware watchdog triggers and reboots the system and say, okay, here something went wrong. So start, we start the hardware watchdog in the bootloader. That's important too. The bootloader is the first step here. Then keep it running. That's many, many drivers in the kernel um, by default will reset the watchdog hardware when the driver initializes. And it will not activate the, dri the, the watchdog until the user space activates the watchdog again. So there, there are ways um, that you can basically tell the driver not to touch the watchdog at the beginning or the state of the watchdog, but you need to make sure that that happens actually. And then systemd comes up, so that's one part I'm always using actually. Systemd um, has really great infrastructure for that. So systemd starts, opens the watchdog and starts triggering that. So as long as systemd itself is in a useful state, um, it will continue to trigger the watchdog and as long as that happens, we say, okay, systemd is okay, and systemd will handle all the other errors and propagate those correctly. That brings me to the next part, systemd. Um, don't forget to handle all cases, because systemd will happily trigger the watchdog while it's stuck in a situation where basically nothing works. Um, for example, emergency and rescue targets. 
System Leap by default is, is configured in a way for, for a desktop user or a server where an administrator can log in and say, hey, what's going on? What went wrong here? And so if the FS check of the root file system fails or at the critical file systems, or if you cannot reach your default target system, you will start these uh, rescue targets or, or, or emergency targets, and then you may, be, may get a shell there. But for an embedded system, the shell will help nothing because there is no one in front of it that can actually do something with it. So you need to um, put some service there that will actually do something useful like restart your system. And then we come to the actual applications, and that's where uh, most of the work usually is um, for the individual devices, for the individual project, is you need to figure out what do I need to check to verify that's running, that's still running, to make sure, yes, my system started, and yes, it's still working, and it's doing its job. Um, Systemd will, leave, uh, will give you a lot of tools for that. There's a watchdog for, per application, basically the SD notify hooks where you can, or can uh, say, yes, I've started, and then later on you start pinging. Yes, I'm still here, I'm still here, I'm still here. And if you stop, then Systemd will either restart your application or um, kill it completely or act on that depending on the option. There's this, um, the failure action, basically, um, or there is the start limit stuff where you can say, okay, if it, the service restarted three times in five minutes, then maybe it's not going to start again properly, so let's do something, maybe reboot the system. Um, or if you prefer to ha fail immediately, is the failure action to say, okay, this, this service failed in some way, let's immediately reboot the system. These kind of things help um, to propagate errors from the individual applications to systemd, and from there you can then restart your system and say, okay, now um, the bootloader is again here at, uh, um, there to, to make the next decision which system is going to start. Um, and that's pretty tricky, actually, because what do we actually want? When do we say the current system that's running um, is not working out for us, so let's go to the last one? Um, basically, uh, from, from a high-level perspective, is if the error is transient, well, let's try again, right? Maybe it works out afterwards. If it's uh, persistent, if the, then uh, we can try again and again. At some point, we have to say, okay, well, it's still not working, so let's go back to the previous um, system. But that really depends on what your individual requirements are. Maybe this one part of the system, well, okay, it fails. Too bad, but let's stay running. Or um, the other part that's really, really important. Um, so we need to um, reboot into the old version. And that really can be some kind of conflicting uh, requirements, because if you say, OK, I cannot reach my update server, but the actual application is working. I want to have my new service running, but I need to go back somewhere to do an update for later on. So it's really a decision process where you have to look at all the possible failures and decide this is where I go back and this is where I stay with the current system and how often do I try to reboot uh, and to restart individual services or restart the whole system. Um, and to actually implement that, I'm using here Bearbox as a bootloader as example. That's basically because that's what I'm working with most of the time. And it has, it has this um, boot chooser. Um, basically, what it, do, what it does is you have a slot. This is one version of your A, B scenario, is one slot. The A is one slot, B is one slot. It says, OK, either, both of them have a priority and a boot counter. And then Bearbox comes and says, OK, the priority is for this one is higher, so I try this one and look at the boot counter. Boot counter is greater than zero, okay, minus one, and then start this one. And then in the user space, you have to reset that boot counter, and there are 
various ways where you can use that to implement different kind of scenarios where, where you say, um, okay, I tried this multiple times or a failure at startup is more important than a failure later on and these kind of things. The important thing is that reset, um, that we can reset those um, boot counters again because, I mean, let's say there's an outside effect that causes failure. Say the power is re really low and the system starts, and as soon as you start powering on additional components, it breaks down and resets the system. And then you do that in a loop and say, okay, three times, four times my system failed. Okay, let's fall over to the previous version. And then you try it here three times, four times, and then, yeah, both boot counters are zero. And what do we do now? We have no system that's seemingly working. And then I can either say, I guess, get stuck here and don't do anything, or we can say, hmm, maybe there were some outside effects. So if all systems say boot counter zero can't do anything, we start for, again from the beginning with reset the boot counters to some value, typically three or five or whatever you want, and then try again. And maybe that now the power is better and then it works again. And also important, atomic updates. This is something where I like it's built in into the Bearbox bootloader. It's something where a lot of people spend time fixing things because writing multiple values on an embedded system in an atomic way that any, when any time the power fails, it's still there in a consistent state, that's pretty tricky. Because if you have a NAND flash, for example, then doing okay, I need to erase this block and I need to write here and there and do things in a way that at any time the power can fail, that's pretty hard. And so there's this basically a framework there that says, okay, set these val values and then now sync it to whatever backend storage we have and then it's always an atomic update. So... And now let's look at actually how we use that. Just a few examples um, what you can t do. And this is basically a um, one end of the, of, of, of the range of, of options. You may probably want to do something in the middle, but this is okay for many cases. Actually, that what many actual people actually do right now is this, well, at startup, um, maybe things can fail. But afterwards, everything errors that come there, that just transient, they, it works afterwards again after we reboot. It's probably true in many cases because it will work for a time if it's an error that's, some, say, a memory leak, right? A memory leak that, uh, that accumulates memory over time, so it runs for three days and then runs out of memory, we reset the system, it runs again for three days. That's okay and, under some circumstances um, because the system is running for th three days, which means at the very least, it's running for three days in which, ta in which time we can actually continue uh, and update a new system. So we can write a new update in there and that's always the most important thing that you're always in a situation where you can write a new update so you can fix things. Um, in this case, we just reset the boot counter when the system has successfully booted. SystemD will help us with that because we can just pick a target and say, okay, we have this target and any application, any service um, must be, uh, is required by this tr um, target. So um, if any of those fail, then we never reach this target and um, then we have one service that waits for this target and says, okay, when we reach this target, we have the next service in the, in the, in the chain, and this one will simply just reset the uh, boot counters for uh, the running system. If you're a bit more paranoid, you say, well, any errors may be, per um, may be permanent, so we don't actually reset the boot counter um, after booting. So the system starts, the bootloader, um, counts down the boot counter, and then it's okay, and it's running. And only if we do an explicit reboot of the system, if we trigger a normal reboot, for example, after an update or for whatever reason else, then we reset the boot counter. Say, so, okay, it's running for some time, and um, then uh, 
it's, uh, it's good and everything works and maybe we need to reboot for whatever reason or not, then um, this, this is kind of like any failure later on, it triggers a reset, the boot kind of was not reset and um, so it's count counting down. However, uh, well, if you're developing or something, it's often this, well, let's switch off the device and on again and do work, work if <coughs> and retry. Doing things that will, you will never actually reset the boot count. It happens pretty easily that you, you run into the case that um, you accidentally start the old system because um, you didn't actually never reach the situation where the boot counters were reset. So this is the other extreme. So there must be, in most cases, probably somewhere in between that you say, maybe it's running for five days and now it looks good. Or you have an outside operator actually monitoring your device and says, hey, this device was running for 10 days and this looks good, so let's reset the boot counter. It's probably working uh, uh, properly now. Um, it's really um, application specific, device specific, what kind of choices you make for that. Um, but that's um, what I like here for the system um, we, we have with um, systemd doing the monitoring and Bearbox with its state and um, relatively isolated here is the state and you can modify it with any, with any tool here. Um, you can choose when when you update these states, when you when do you reset the counters, and you can modify how it reacts um, to your requirements. Um, so let's go to a bit nicer topic. We're always talking about failures. Um, let's talk a bit of user interaction because update has a lot of to do with users as soon as there is actually someone watching. Um, it can be someone local. A lot of devices are starting to get. Um, this uh, uh, place, more and more devices with this place, and where you can display some info and see bro progress of an update and these kind of things. Or it's a remote operator that says, okay, I installed this update here and I want to see something. Um, and then it's, it helps actually, because if you can, if, if you can ask a user to or the user can decide to turn the device completely off and on again, you can uh, use that to handle errors as well. Because, uh, well, if you cannot detect it in your software, maybe because it's a high-level user interaction stuff, they, you can still um, trigger a reset of the whole system by turning the power off and on. And you can use that, okay, the power was turned off, we didn't reset the boot counter, so we can't. So it's one less. And if we try that multiple times, then we start the, the old system at some point, or immediately. Um, or we can reset the boot counters um, after power off and have this um, all counters for zero. And after power, uh, doing a power cycle once, we start again trying to do things. It really depends on the case situation. And you can also say you have something in your UI to do, um, yeah, switch to the old system because this is not working. Um, or, uh, uh, yeah, these kind of things. This is faster, I think I don't have that much time. Um, and what's really important, what I think is, an update takes time. Even if it's running more or less in the background because you can <coughs> still do the actual job, um, if it's a device where a user is standing in front of it, puts the USB stick in, say, do run my update, and then it says nothing for 10 minutes, that's going to be, yeah, the update is not working. Let's power off and try again. So adding information there to update is really important, I think. So, and also in case of error handling, um, you're your customer says, yeah, it's not working, and then say, well, yeah, and it says, the customer says, well, I don't know what, why, and if you don't have, can, can pull out some information that's integrated with your application where you can pull in your log files, that's pretty hard to debug afterwards. So 
not just a black box. And I've put here the, the route, this one update system. I know it because my colleagues are working on it. Um, that just has a debug API and says, hey, I'm doing this and this and this step. So yeah, that's it. A few links there, but just a bit of answers. Questions? Getting pretty late. No questions anymore. OK. I think then that's it for today.